Purgatory, Chapter 5 Location of Purgatory Revelations of the Saints St. Teresa, St. Louis Bertrand, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi St. Teresa had a great charity towards the souls in Purgatory and assisted them as much lay in her power by her prayers and good works. In recompense, God frequently showed her the souls she had delivered. She saw them at the moment of their release of sufferings and of their entrance into heaven. Now they generally came forth from the bosom of the earth. I received tidings, she writes, of the death of a religious, who had formerly been provincial of that province, and afterwards of another. I was acquainted with them, and he had rendered me great service. This intelligence caused me great uneasiness. Although this man was commendable for many virtues, I was apprehensive for the salvation of his soul, because he had been a superior of a space of twenty years, and I always fear much for those who are charged with the care of souls. Much grieved, I went to an oratory. There I conjured our divine Lord, to apply to his religious the little good I had done during my life, and to supply the rest of his infinite merits, in order that this soul might be freed from purgatory. While I besought his grace with all the fervor of which I was capable, I saw on my right side this soul came forth from the depths of the earth and ascended to heaven in ramparts of joy. Although this priest was advanced in years, he appeared to me with the features of a man who had not yet attained the age of thirty, and with a countenance resplendent with light. This vision, though very short, left me unindated with joy, and without a shadow of doubt as to the truth of what I had seen. As I was separated by a great distance from the place where this servant of God had ended his days, it was some time before I learned the particular of his edifying death. All those who were witnesses of it could not behold without admiration how he preserved consciousness to the last moment, the tears he shed, and the sentiments of humility with which he surrendered his soul to God. A religious of my community, a great servant of God, had been dead not quite two days. We were saying the office for the dead for her in choir. A sister was reading the lesson, and I was standing to say the versicle. When half of the lesson had been said, I saw the soul of this religious come forth from the depths of the earth, like the one of which I have just spoken, and go to heaven. In this same monastery there died, at the age of eighteen or twenty years, another religious, a true model of fervor, regularity, and virtue. Her life had been but a tissue of maladies and sufferings patiently endured. I had no doubt, after having seen her live thus, that she had more than sufficient merits to exempt her from purgatory. Nevertheless, while I was at office, before she was interred, and about a quarter of an hour after her death, I saw her soul likewise issue from the earth and rise to heaven. Behold what St. Teresa writes. A like instance is recorded in the life of St. Louis Bertrand, of the Order of St. Dominic. This life, written by Father Antist, a religious of the same order, who lived with the saint, is inserted in the Acta Sanctorum on the 10th of October. In the year 1557, whilst St. Louis Bertrand resided at the convent of Valencia, the pest broke out in that city. The terrible plague spread rapidly, threatening to exterminate the inhabitants, and each one trembled for his life. A religious of the community, wishing to prepare himself fervently for death, made a general confession of his whole life to the saint, and on leaving him said, Father, if it should now please God to call me, I shall return and make known to you my condition in the other life. He died a short time afterwards, and the following night he appeared to the saint. 
He told them that he was detained in purgatory on account of a few slight faults, which remained to be expiated, and begged the saint to recommend him to the community. St. Louis communicated the request immediately to the prior, who hastened to recommend the soul of the departed to the prayers and sacrifices of his brethren assembled in chapter. Six days later, a man in the town, who knew nothing of what had passed at the convent, came to make his confession to Father Louis, and told him that the soul of the Father Clement had appeared to him. He saw, he said, the earth open, and the soul of the deceased father come forth all glorious. It resembled, he added, a resplendent star which rose through the air towards heaven. We read in the life of St. Magdalene de Pazzi, written by her confessor, Father Capari, of the Company of Jesus, that this servant of God was made witness of the deliverance of a soul under the following circumstances. One of her sisters in religion had died some time previous, when the saint begged one day in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, saw issue from the earth the soul of that sister, still captive in the dungeons of purgatory. She was enveloped in a mantle of flames, under which a robe of dazzling whiteness projected her from the fierce heat of the fire, and she remained an entire hour at the foot of the altar, adoring in inexpressible annihilation the hidden God of the Eucharist. This hour of adoration, which Magdalene saw her perform, was the last of her penance. That hour passed, she arose and took her flight to heaven. Purgatory, Chapter 6 Location of Purgatory St. Francis of Rome St. Magdalene de Pazzi It has pleased God to show us in spirit the gloomy abodes of purgatory in some privileged souls, who were to reveal the sorrowful mysteries thereof for the edification of the faithful. Of this number was illustrious St. Francis, foundress of the Oblates, who died in Rome in 1440. God favored her with great lights concerning the state of her souls and the other life. She saw hell in its horrible torments. She saw also the interior of purgatory in the mysterious order. I had almost said hierarchy of expiations, which reigns in the portion of the Church of Jesus Christ. In obedience to her superiors, who thought themselves bound to impose this obligation upon her, and her visions written at the request of the venerable canon Mattiotti, her spiritual director, have all the authenticity that can be desired in such matters. Now the servant of God declared that, after having endured with unspeakable horror the visions of hell, she came out of that abyss and was conducted by her celestial guide into the regions of purgatory. There reigned neither horror nor disorder, nor despair, nor eternal darkness. Their divine hope diffused its light, and she was told that this place of purification was called also Sojourn of Hope. She saw their souls which suffered cruelly, but angels visited and assisted them in their sufferings. Purgatory, she said, is divided into three distinct parts which are the three large provinces of that kingdom of suffering. They are situated the one beneath the other, and occupied by souls of different orders. These souls are buried more deeply in proportion as they are more defiled and farther removed from the time of their deliverance. The lowest region is filled with a fierce fire, but which is not dark like that of hell. It is vast burning sea, throwing forth immense flames. Innumerable souls are plunged into its depths. Here are those who have rendered themselves guilty of mortal sins, which they have duly confessed, but not sufficiently expiated during life. The servant of God then learned that, for all forgiven mortal sins, there remains to be underwent a suffering of seven years. This term cannot evidently be taken to mean a definite measure, 
since mortal sin differ in enormity, but as an average penalty. Although the souls are enveloped in these flames, their sufferings are not the same. They differ according to the number and nature of their former sins. In this lower purgatory, the saint held laics and persons consecrated to God. The laics were those who, after a life of sin, had had the happiness of being sincerely converted. The persons consecrated to God were those who had not lived according to the sanctity of their state. At that same moment she saw descend the soul of a priest whom she knew, but whose name she does not reveal. She remarked that he had a face covered with a veil which concealed a stain. Although he had led an edifying life, this priest had not always observed strict temperance and had sought too eagerly the satisfaction of the table. The saint was then conducted into the intermediate purgatory, destined for souls which had deserved a less rigorous chastisement. It had three distinct compartments. One resembled an immense dungeon of ice, the cold of which was indescribably intense. The second, on the contrary, was like a huge cauldron of boiling oil and pitch. The third had the appearance of a pond of liquid metal resembling molten gold or silver. The upper purgatory, which the saint does not describe, is the temporary abode of souls which suffer little, accept the pain of loss, and approach the happy moment of their deliverance. Such in substance is the vision of St. Francis relative to purgatory. The following is an account of that of St. Magdalene de Pazzi, a Florentine Carmelite, as it is related in her life by Father Capari. It gives more of a picture of purgatory, whilst the preceding vision but traces its outlines. Some time before her death, which took place in 1607, the servant of God, Magdalene de Pazzi, being one evening with several other religious in this garden of her convent, she was ravished in ecstasy and saw purgatory open before her. At the same time, as she made known later, a voice invited her to visit all the prisons of the divine justice and to see how truly worthy of compassion are the souls detained there. At this moment she was heard to say, Yes, I will go. She consented to undertake this painful journey. In fact, she walked for two hours round the garden, which was very large, pausing from time to time. Each time she interrupted her walk, she contemplated attentively the sufferings which were shown to her. She was then seen to wringing her hand in compassion. Her face became pale, her body bent over under the weight of sufferings, in presence of the terrible spectacle with which she was confronted. She began to cry aloud in lamentation, Mercy, my God, mercy! Descend, O precious blood, and deliver these souls from their prison. Poor souls! You suffer so cruelly, and yet you are content and cheerful. The dungeons of the martyrs, in comparison with these, are gardens of delight. Nevertheless, there are others still deeper. How happy should I esteem myself were I not obliged to go down to them! She did descend, however, for she was forced to continue her way. But when she had taken a few steps, she stopped terror-stricken, and sighed deeply, she cried, What? Religious also in this dismal abode? Good God! How they are tormented! Ah, Lord! She does not explain the nature of their sufferings, but the horror which she manifested in contemplating them caused her to sigh at each step. She passed from it thence into less gloomy places. They were the dungeons of simple souls, and of children whom ignorance and lack of reason extenuated many faults. Their torments appeared to her much more endurable than those of the others. Nothing but ice and fire were there. She noticed that these souls had their angels guardian with them, who fortified them greatly by their presence. But she saw also demons whose dreadful forms increased their sufferings. 
Advancing a few paces, she saw Sol still more unfortunate, and she was heard to cry out, Oh, how terrible is this place! It is full of hideous demons and incredible torments. Who, oh my God, are the victim of these cruel tortures? Alas, they are being pierced with sharp swords. They are being cut into pieces. She was answered that they were the souls whose conduct had been tainted with hypocrisy. Advancing a little, she saw a great multitude of souls, which were bruised, as it were, and crushed under a press, and she understood that they were the souls which had been addicted to impatience and disobedience during life. Whilst contemplating them, her looks, her sighs, her whole attitude betokened compassion and terror. A moment later, her agitation increased and she uttered a dreadful cry. It was the dungeon of lies, which now lay open before her. After having attentively considered it, she cried aloud, Liars are confined in a place in the vicinity of hell, and their sufferings are exceedingly great. Molten lead is poured into their mouths. I see them burn, at the same time tremble with cold. She then went to the prison of those souls which had sinned through weakness, and she was heard to exclaim, Alas, I had thought to find you among those who have sinned through ignorance, but I am mistaken. You burn with an intenser fire. Farther on, she perceived souls that had been too much attracted to the goods of this world and had sinned through avarice. What blindness, she said thus eagerly seek to perishable fortune. Those whom formerly riches could not sufficiently sedate are here gorged with torments. They are smelted like metal in the furnace. From thence she passed into the place where those souls were imprisoned, which had formerly been stained with impurity. She saw them in so filthy and pestilential a dungeon that the sight produced nausea. She turned away quickly from that loathsome spectacle. Seeing the ambitious and the proud, she said, Behold those who wish to shine before men. Now they are condemned to live in so frightful obscurity. Then she was shown these souls, which had been guilty of ingratitude towards God. They were a prey of unutterable torments, and as it were drowned in a lake of molten lead for having by their ingratitude dried up the source of piety. Finally, in a last dungeon, she was shown souls that had not been given to any particular vice, but which, through lack of a proper vigilance over themselves, have committed all kinds of trivial faults. She remarked that those souls had a share in the chastisements of all vices, in a moderate degree, because those faults committed only from time to time rendered them less guilty than those committed through habit. After this last station, the saint left the garden, begged God never again to make her witness of so heart-rendering a spectacle. She felt that she had not strength to endure it. Her ecstasy still continued, and conversing with Jesus, she said to him, Tell me, Lord, what was your design in discovering to me those terrible prisons, of which I knew so little, and comprehend still less? Ah, uh, I now see, you wish to give me the knowledge of your infinite sanctity, and to make me detest more and more the least stain of sin, which is so abominable in your eyes.' 